Who uh, are you? Sorry? Who are you? I am Corey. Uh, I've been doing JavaScript for many years now, and that's boring, so let's get on with this. <laughs> um, so, hands up if you're like really confident you <laughs> you know how the how the event loop works in JavaScript. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's good. I like to not get up here and talk about shit people already know. Um, yeah, so everybody knows that <coughs> J, uh, JS executes synchronously, right? So you have a line of code, you will execute that line of code, and you have another line of code that will execute that line of code. You will not do anything while that is happening. Nothing. It cannot. It's not actually possible. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much correct. The only way you can exit a stack is by running the stack, as in a, like a, a call stack, except for, of course, throwing an error. Um, that will exit the stack. But other than that. Oh, hello. Uh, go on. We lost you. Turn it off and on again. Hello, computer. It takes three seconds. Hello, hello computer. There you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, but other than that, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> grab that, grab the mic. This happened last time. It's okay. It's not you. It's us. Hello. Hey. Is that working? That is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, but other than that, the code just pretty much runs from the top to the bottom, and that's it. So then, why is JavaScript so good at asynchronous? I think you may notice that. I don't know if you do notice this, but JavaScript is better than pretty much every other language at doing asynchronous operations. Um, does anyone here use PHP? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so the way PHP works basically is it goes the first line, and then it's like, read a file. And it goes, ah, oh, the next line. That's how PHP works, and that's why it's so slow. I mean, anyway. Uh, so the way, the way that Joshua works is very different. It doesn't really do anything. Oh, that does not fit on the screen, and I can't maximize it because I've uh, I've captured the event handler for the F11. Mm. There you go. So JavaScript is more like a manager. It doesn't really do anything. It just kind of sits around. Um, it delegates tasks. So people come to it and say, I want a thing. And it goes, OK, hey, file system. Go do that thing. And then it goes, all right, next person, what do you want? And they're like, oh, there's another thing. And it goes, all right, set time at person. Tell me, let me know something in like 10 seconds. And then it goes, the next person. So it doesn't actually do anything. It just kind of sits there in the middle and delegates tasks. Um, so you got things like FS, a read file, write file, etc. HTTP listen is similar to that. All these things basically sit there in the background, and that's all scheduled by the runtime, so V8 or Node or the browser or whatever. So all that sort of stuff just kind of sits there and does its thing as threaded or whatever, well not threaded, but you know, in, as, uh, what's that thing, scheduled, you know, process the time scheduled as possible in parallel or whatever. But JavaScript just runs and then it stops. And then if there's anything working over here, it just waits. And then eventually someone goes like, hey, this thing's done. It goes, okay, sweet. And then it just pipes that to the output, be that a, a web page or so, like a, a response or whatever. So. Uh, that's not highlighted very well. Oh well, it's really hard to read. Okay, so in this case, JavaScript comes along and goes, all right, log that. While that's logging, which doesn't take very long, but while it's running, nothing at all can happen at all in any part of your file in your, in your entire node process. That's it, completely blocked. So it logs starting, and then it says, all right, read file. I want to read this file, and that encoding. When you're done, we'll call back, cool. What that does, it basically tells Node, start reading that file. That's it. Then it goes, okay, that command is done, because it said it's done its job, which is tell the file system to do something. And it goes, all right, log, stack done, so it'll log. And then later, once the file is actually read, Node goes, hey, JavaScript, run this next bit of stack, which is this function here, basically. And so it runs that, and it logs done. Does that make sense to most people? If you want, actually, one thing I wanted to do is have a mic, a lapel mic that I could. Anyway, I'm going to actually run this code. Um, oh, yes, I am good. Thought I wasn't going to be able to select it there. <laughs> because of that reason. Excellent. So. Uh, my, my crew, sorry. Small terminal. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, my preparation was so good that I uh, didn't do anything pretty much for this sort of stuff. That is not at all what I want. So this is the code that's running. Here it is. Sweet. And so I just realized I'm going to go. Because as I said, I didn't prepare anything. So it doesn't actually matter what this is. What the hell are you doing? You're in mode. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <coughs> Here's our code. It's on the first line, it's just some basically hooks to make the debugger work. So on the next line of code we have Okay, so you can see in the stack there's stuff that is nothing to do with our code. Uh, some timeouts and stuff, because that's how it works. Uh, this piece of code gets is basically the first thing that gets injected into the uh, event. The first thing that gets injected into the event loop, which is the, the, the code, your entry point to your entire software. And it node just goes, okay, run the first thing in the event loop. It starts here, and it goes, okay, log starting. Then it goes, refile. Right now, it's probably already done that. So after that, in a different process, I guess, or in a different scheduled area, that file is being read by the file system, doesn't block node, node just continues. If that was taking, if that took 10 seconds, it would just wouldn't matter, it would just continue. It would then log that the stack is done. The break button here. And you'll notice over here, here's our call stack. We've got basically actually run <coughs> the module for the very first time, and then our function. And now if you let that run, we'll come in here and say done. Now if you look at this call stack, this is the next event in the event loop. So the file system handle up basically said, I'm done. Next, the next stack to run is this stack. And in this case, it's some crap inside FS, which pulls a call back and then it runs our code. Cool. Peter adds right So, the reason this works so well in Node compared to, well, pretty much everything else is that Node has first class functions, which means that you can just say, here's some stuff to do later. You can't really do that in other languages very easily without horrible hacks like async await. Um, that's why async await exists, is because other languages don't have the ability to run tasks like to like schedule tasks inside their language. They can, you know, things like uh, like um, PHP, you've got like Yemen where you can say like here's here's a task that goes and runs in like a completely different thing and then later it comes back. Because you can just create packets of functionality in JavaScript so easily, it makes this stuff really, really easy. And that's why Node and, and, and the browser leverage it so well. It's because it was actually made for the browser places where there's a lot of asynchronous stuff happening, like clicks, you know. That sort of stuff doesn't happen Synchronously, someone comes along and goes click, and then that has to be raised and has to be run. So this is effectively the implementation of the event queue in JavaScript, <coughs> uh, for JavaScript rather. It's in pseudo code because it's obviously I'm not going to implement the actual event loop. But you've got effectively a counter, like how many things are running currently, a queue of things to execute, as in things that are completed, asynchronous tasks that have finished running, and they need to be done next. Uh, a way to increment that counter, and a way to decrement that counter, and push in the next piece of work to be done into the stack, or into the queue rather. Uh, the pro uh, your runtime executes the main program, which inside it potentially calls FS, it calls set timeout, all that sort of stuff, and then it runs the event loop. Well, it's kind of part of it, but anyway. Effectively, it would more accurately probably push the main program into the event loop, and then run it, but anyway. So then it loops, it goes, is there anything to be done next? If there is, it shifts that off, runs it, 
and then it loops. If there's async, async stuff running, and as in if that counter is still above zero, it loops. So it just loops and loops and loops and loops and loops, and then eventually fs set timeout blah 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 whatever calls async complete basically decrements that and pushes it into the the event queue, and then it'll come into loop and go oh there's something in there cool pop it off or shift it off rather run it and then loop. If there's nothing left to do, as in there's nothing in the event queue and there's nothing currently running, it goes oh I'm done and exits. I know it at least in the browser it just kind of sits there and continuously loops. Good. Does that make sense to everyone? Pretty much. So here's an example of like how, you, how maybe potentially read file is implemented. Takes file path options and callback. It says, oh yeah, by the way, because this is not you're not in JavaScript anymore. This is like C or whatever. These things happen effectively synchronously. So it says asynchronous stuff is started. It tells the uh, event queue there is stuff to be currently being work, work being done. It then reads the file and it pauses on that line because it's not JavaScript, we're in whatever. And then it says, it's complete. Here is the stack to run next, which is the callback with the error in the file. Set timeout, very similar. Just says, I have started some stuff. It waits for a bit. Once the wait's complete, it says, run this, this next bit of code. Uh, HTTP listener, now this is, uh, I just made this up. This is probably not actually how it works, but this would theoretically work. It says, listen for HTTP stuff. So async started, as in there is some, there are listeners in place that don't basically don't kill the no process. We, we have stuff to, to care about later. When our network later says a request is reviewed, call complete on that one, run the response handler, and then say I'm going to listen again. So what that actually effectively means is that no can only accept one request at a time. But because it doesn't do anything, it can accept thousands, not tens of thousands of requests within like a second or so, or, or you know, hundreds of a second or a tenth of a second or whatever. So even though it does one thing at a time, because it's not doing any heavy lifting, it's extremely fast. Okay, one thing I wouldn't mind doing if people are interested, I don't know, this could be like a bit silly, but I was gonna suggest maybe we get some people up to actually see JavaScript and Node. They wanted to. So I'll be just you want to go up? Sure. Alright, maybe like three people total, maybe. Sorry, so three people each size. So six people total. Uh, at least three people need to have their phones on them. So Brandon, come on. No, you don't want to? Come on. Yeah. We're gonna have we only have one we're gonna have one judge one user and one file system. Do you wanna go over there then file system? You're the file system. <laughs> file system demon. Okay, do you have your laptop or something or a phone or whatever that you can, you're going to use that? Okay, so I'm JavaScript, you're going to say, hey, I'm going to be a proxy for like, I'm like a HTTP proxy. He's going to ask me for a web page, and I'm going to ret retrieve that web page. You're actually not fast than your HTTP. Okay. What web page would you like? Um, Google. Get Google, please. <laughs> get, no, actually get Google. Oh. <laughs> Any other users? Well, does anyone want a page? Any other pages? NASA. Yep. Hey, also get NASA. As you can see, I'm not really doing anything. Eleven party. Don't. Yep. <laughs> Reject that response. Here's here's Google. Oh, thanks. You know, get NASA. No, I'm just joking. But you can see, like, it, me as JavaScript, I don't do anything. But also, if I would have liked more people to come up, but anyway, it doesn't really matter, whatever. Just ruin it for me. Um, let's say there were like 10 people here. They All 10 people want to do things right now. So I go to the first person, what do you want? And they go this, and I go, get that. And you go, all right, next person, what do you want? Get that. Etc. So I do one person at a time. I only ever do one thing at a time. And then this guy, or how many processes of you, multiple versions of you, all go do your thing, and then you come back and I go, yep, here's Google, here's NASA, etc. All right, thank you, that was, that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, everyone's about to say, what about async await? I'm gonna say, I don't care. Okay, so, who here's heard of async await in JavaScript? 
Who here uses async await in JavaScript? Okay. Cool. Who here knows how it works? Magic. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So, you know how over the last 20, how many years JavaScript has existed? The way it works is the line runs, and then 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 it finishes. Async await comes and just goes. But it just changes how JavaScript works completely. So instead, what it does is it runs until it gets to the next await, and then it takes that function in its current state, shards it on ice, waits for that thing to call back, then it revives the function, but it replaces the, that, it puts the result into the thing, and then it goes to the next await, and then it waits for that one, except it doesn't necessarily, that's how um, the current, like if you're using Babel right now, um, you pretty much don't do parallel if you do it like this. So in this case, if you had to wait for x and then wait for y, and then return x plus y, and both x and y took one second, your code would take two seconds. Because Babel is not smart enough to run them in parallel. In theory, and I'm pretty sure actually the current implementations in Node don't parallelize them. I'm not 100% sure about that, but they don't. I'm pretty sure, yeah. yeah. So currently, if you're using async await, you are running slowly, because it's shit. If you want it to run in parallel, and I'm assuming they're either there now or they're gonna get there really soon, what the engine needs to do is say, okay, X is going to be a promise that will eventually resolve. Cool, continue to Y. Right, Y is gonna be a promise that's gonna eventually resolve. Get to the next state, which is return X plus Y, and go, ah, X and Y haven't finished yet. I'll pause at this line, because this is the line that I need those pieces of data at. But yes, at the moment, it's just dumb and doesn't know, it doesn't know that X isn't needed until the return, so it'll just sit there and wait on X until it's done, and then it'll wait on Y until it's done, and then it will return X plus Y. So that's a completely different way to work how like Joshua has worked for, like I said the last 20 years. And I'm not sitting here to say like all things are good, I'm just saying like it's this huge fundamental change and we don't need it. Like you can do this stuff, even effectively this stuff, without this. This is just like because C sharp is bad at async and this is bad at async and that's bad at async, better make JavaScript bad at async as well. Like, anyway. So yes, very much, yeah. I was actually thinking there might be a, quite a few questions at the end, because it is a rel relatively, uh, I guess, technical topic. Um, and I did a really shit job of it. So does anyone have any questions? And I mean, like, any questions. Um, yep. How is using async await any different from doing nested callbacks or? It's not different to doing nested callbacks, but you can run two callbacks at the same time and then get the results of both. Yeah, right, but you still have to wait for both of them to finish. You do have to wait for both of them to finish, but with async await, if you have x and y and they're both asynchronous, it waits for x to finish and then it starts y. Would callbacks not do the same thing though? No. Yeah, just pointing out, that's because that's the way you wrote it. You can get both of them to execute at the same time. I am aware, if you use special Specialist code effectively. If you are, if you know what you're looking for, uh, and you know that you're in JavaScript and you haven't come from another language, then you would know to write specific code to make it execute at the same time. However, if you're just an average user, and say you came from C sharp and you run that, it will not run asynchronously. It will run all over, but it will run one after the other in a waterfall. So the code does not describe its intention very well at the moment. Eventually, once they implement that, it will, but right now, it doesn't. So are you suggesting stuff like uh, all, promise not all? Yeah, and um, they won't change it because uh, the async await specification is designed to go to follow down the just in time path. Really? Because what if you need the result of the previous? Yeah, if that's easy. Right. You can find out the token. The the result token in the um, execution tree will be able to know that. So, like for example, in, in the case of um, man, I really need this. I've been considering writing um, an interpreter that can do this exact thing that I'm talking about thought that they were just doing it, so yeah, I've got to actually do it. So in this case, um, the execution of x plus y, that would be effectively uh, an execution step in the AST. All I would have to do is go, okay, x, uh, the addition operator takes a left and a right. Do I have both my left and right? No, are they eventuals? Yes. Wait until they're both done and then run them. So there's no reason for y to pause before x because it doesn't need x and it knows it doesn't need x because it's the engine. It, it knows, it's not using X. X is, the identifier X isn't used anywhere within that tree except for inside return X plus Y. 
that make sense? Or I mean, did I explain that poorly? You, you have. Like, <laughs> wait, did you say poorly? No, yeah, you poorly. explained it well. No, you explained it well, sorry. So, um, effectively, yeah. you end up with, um, there are three statements in this in this function, right? So in your AST, there will be a, an effectively an array of uh, statements inside this function body. It gets the first statement and it executes it. That execution is effectively create an eventual x that will happen at some stage. And then you can go to the next statement and go, all right, is there anything inside this statement that needs x? Now it knows that because it's just an identifier. It can, it can easily pass that. That's not hard at all. It goes, no, there's nothing to do, do y. And it can set off y straight away as well. It can then go down to the return statement and go, okay, so what's inside the return statement? There's an addition operator, cool. It's got a left and a right, x and y. I need both x and y. Wait until both of those are complete, then the, the addition operation and return that. I think that, like, in this idealized case, you're correct. There are just a lot of those cases that you couldn't couple to that. Like, if, if await foo set something on the global, but then bar required, um, but was getting with uh, the result of something else, so you couldn't, like, get the tokens that were making it up, there would yep. be cases that you couldn't. That sounds like a whole lot of your followers are developed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're correct. Like, I wouldn't so if you, you can't, like, basically, the whole point of a bench is that you use the result of a bench and the bench are, are effectively um, stateless. So, yeah. if the answer is they're not doing it because you could do stuff like that, then tada! I win. I'm right. Async await sucks. <laughs> um, but seriously, if that is the case, that's that's extremely disappointing. And their code is just no no programs are just going to grind to a halt compared to currently because. This is how everyone's going to write code. I know you can, you can eventually know if you learn enough that you can do like promise like all that sort of stuff. But this is how people are going to write code. It's not clear. It's not obvious that it await. Like I mean, it's either wait foo and a wait bar, but people just want it to run. They don't. They don't want to think about, you know, all this sort of stuff. If if you have to think about this, then it's more difficult than if you don't use it at all. You can do this with just standard callbacks, easier than you can with async await. So what's the point? So that particular bit of code there is exactly how C sharp runs. Yes. So there is no difference between C sharp and JavaScript. Like, I mean, wait for the first one to run, then it will wait. Yep. Yep. Exactly. One after the first one to run. Yep. And then you've got to do a task run all to wait for X and Y. So this exactly. is pretty much exactly the same thing. Yes. Exactly. They basically took a concept that was worse in a different language and even added to a language that can do better jobs. But then you can do this. Exactly, that's exactly my point. Without adding features to it, this is now no longer to about, anyway, whatever. <laughs> Again, as always, I love this conversation, but anyway. Um, yes, the, my point is exactly that, which is that we have the tools, we had the ability to do all this well, people were doing it well for ages, and then people came from other languages and went, gee, I don't know how to do anything, better not learn anything, and just straight up carry across these worst techniques into this language. And we'll change the entire way the language runs to make it work too. Or also, if you get an error, did it, exactly. did, what's it throw? Oh, the file system didn't have the file. Or is it, I wrote bad code. Uh, anyway, we're getting into that conversation as always. Yep. Well, it's not actually all that. So if you add to that exception handling as well, yep. the bugger handling the code with the um, callbacks gets sometimes like to chain up the um, those could be like complex, but yeah, yeah, of like, course. with this you can just do try catch easily. Yes, you can. And it will also tell you nothing about your error. So for example, in a try catch, you don't know whether or not you got an actual exception or a rejection. It's about my uh, favorite analogy at the moment is if you walk into a restaurant and you, the waiter comes up to you and says, "What would you like to order?" You say, "Yeah, I'd like a hamburger," and then the waiter goes away. And then, like a minute later, the waiter comes back and says, "I couldn't get you your hamburger." Is the store on fire? <laughs> is the hamburger not available? Don't know. You're gonna ask the person after the fact, "Why could you not get my hamburger?" And he goes. Oh, because a rampant bear has come in and you should probably get out right now. Whereas if you have a callback, you say, hey, wait, can I please have a hamburger? He goes, right, oh. and he comes running through and goes, oh my god, there's a bear in the kitchen, and then just everyone bats. That's like a throw. Whereas if you're using promises, a throw is just like, there's a bear in the kitchen. <laughs> Would you like a drink? <laughs> and that's, again, that's we're going well into a much more fun topic. Um, yeah, any, yep. With the wait through example there, yep. can other tasks, regular tasks on the event queue? Yes. So what happens in this case, effectively, is on this keyword, oh my god, on that keyword, 
uh, this task gets put into an async backend processing thing -o that says, hey, let me know when foo is done. It then does not run that function. It runs the next thing that would have run after that function in the stack. This is why it's so confusing. It's actually really hard to describe. Uh, puts it into that uh, effectively async handler. Once it completes the async handler, it comes back and says, pushes a stack this function back into the, uh, the event loop. Which, when it gets back to the end of that, it'll go back to the end of this, and it'll say, yep, there's something in there. It'll execute that thing, which will get the await, which will do its thing, push it back into the thing, come back and do the stuff and the dance, etc. Which is no different, really, to how it works if you just use callbacks or if you just use whatever. It's just that it's, uh, you can't really, it's, it's um, yeah, it just happens one after the other in a workflow. Are there any questions that are like, about the actual event <laughs> loop? <laughs> no? Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah? People say that JavaScript is not multi-threaded and it can't take advantage of multiple cores. Yep. But if the underlying operating system is doing all the heavy lifting, does that not mean that it is using multiple cores? I don't believe that it is actually using multiple cores, but it is using uh, processor scheduling. Um, so, when a, when, a, when a stack runs inside JavaScript, it effectively locks that process until the stack is complete, or it throws. Um, and then it defers uh, to the loop, loops back on itself, basically on the next tick, effectively. Um, don't confuse that with uh, process.next tick, because that's not the same thing. It's also, um, then you've got set immediate, so I'm going off topic here, but set immediate doesn't happen immediately, it happens after next tick, obviously. But anyway, yeah, so um, in theory, uh, you could probably write like a C plugin or something like that that does use multiple cores, multiple threads, etc., to do an asynchronous task that JavaScript is called, like that JavaScript calls. So if you had like calculate prime or whatever in your code, you could say like my cool library calculate prime with a callback, which could go off and it'll do like, can you even calculate primes in multiple threads? You can't, I mean, that's a stupid example. But let's just say they have some kind of process and they could have them in multiple uh, threads, like hashing, for example. Then it would do that once the result came back, it would pull back. So, yes, it could take advantage of multiple calls if it were designed to do so, but I don't believe Node by default, like the file system, also stuff does do that. But I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, sorry, back onto the other thing I was saying, which was the set immediate uh, and set timeout and all that sort of stuff. So, set timeout basically says, uh, one millisecond has to have passed before uh, this thing happens, and then it shoves it into the uh, where am I? Uh, into the queue, into this queue here. Uh, set immediate does the same thing, but it puts it at the head of the queue, and next tick does the same thing, but it runs after the stack directly without going to the next loop. So I believe there's effectively like another array of things to do, or array list, whatever you want to call it, stack, <coughs> of things to do that happens uh, before loop actually gets called. So next tick is like literally absolutely the next piece of code that will run with this piece of code. Yeah. That foo bar example you did, if I did promise all and had those two as promises, would they run in parallel? Yes, they would. Okay. How would I do it using the auto? Exactly the same way as promise all would. So basically, the way if you have righto, you basically righto sets uh, sets median sets. No, it doesn't. It sets next tick. I think it says next tick, but I can't actually remember. It's in the source. It either does a next tick or a set immediate and says uh, delegate that task. Delegate that task. And then it waits for them both to call back. And once the number of uh, eventual tasks that are needed to be complete equals the number of tasks that should have completed, it goes, all right, run the pieces of code. So with almost the same implementation as you can see here, a little tiny bit different because adding the X and Y, you need to have that inside an eventual as well explicitly. So it's not quite as JavaScript-y, I guess, at the very last part. <coughs> Other than that, uh, it looks exactly the same. You write it almost exactly the same, but it does run in parallel. And you can do that in ES5. Three. You can do it in ES. You can do it in like probably 2001. Like, yeah. So what's the point? Anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs>